Hi class 10. So, so today we'll be discussing a new chapter and it is industries and today will be the first half of that chapter which is agro based or agriculture based industries. So most of the industries look similar to what we see over here and they have a lot of needs and they have a lot of importance to the country and the nation's economy. When we drive past an industry, we just take it for granted like it's another building where few people work, but industries are really the backbone of our country. And we look deeper into it as to why it is so considered as the backbone of the country and what are the other points related to it. Just like all the time, we'll just go through the syllabus. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 has not been covered yet. While in 9, 10, 11, 12, we know that 12 and 11 is completely finished and 10, we're going to start now. And in 10 manufacturing industries, we'll be looking at the first two lines, which is importance and classification and also about the first half, which is agro based industries, including sugar industry, textile industry, cotton and silk. So sugar, cotton and silk, the three major agro based industries along with the classification and importance of industry. So before we move into the classification, I'll just give an overview of the importance of industries because I just as I told industries play a huge role in the backbone and supporting a nation's economy. There are a lot of points which are critical in, in a way in which it tells that industries are very important. Point number one is that industries offer huge amount of job opportunities. If a new place has an industry, at least 100 to 200 job opportunities will be automatically open. And when you go into an industry, you can see that everybody doesn't work the same kind of job. There will be some kind of workers who are working with the skill they know. There will be some kind of people who uh, transport goods from one place to another. There will be other people who are working with the machines and who know the technical stuff. There will be other people who are in the office doing paperwork. So one industry can give work or opportunity, job opportunities to different kind of people or differently skilled people also. Number two, industries are important in the nation's economy because it really helps in increasing the country's productivity. Mainly we can see that due, during this time where because of the COVID lockdown, we can see people are not going for work and industries are not running. And because of the lack of production, it is really affecting the nation's economy and only when the nation produces a lot of goods the nation has its needs which are met and it is able to sell goods to the other countries and increase its economy number three is that the resources are properly used for example india is a country which has a lot of iron resources what is the use if you don't if you have so much iron resources but have no iron and steel industry all the resources will still stay inside the surface of the earth but when it is taken out, when it is manufactured, when it is converted into steel and when it is used for making different goods and machines, the resources which the country is having is properly used. Number four is increasing export and decreasing import. When we are able to use our resources, we are able to increase the amount of products we make and we are able to sell a lot of products and export increases and import decreases only by increasing export and decreasing import will be able to improve the economy of the country and the last point can be a better way of life for the people who are related to the industry directly and indirectly for example not everyone is of us is directly related to an industry but there will be people who are directly working in industry both their lives is becoming better because of the industry and our life is also becoming better because of the industry so industry has many many benefits and the five points which i've explained would be the five major advantages or importance of industry moving into the classification we will classify the industry based on five aspects raw material being number one product being number two size of the industry being number three ownership being number four and others instead of others we learn as location and market being number five and finished product being number six so, so there are six major classification criteria for industries okay we'll start Number one, raw material. What goes into the industry? Industry is a place where raw materials go in, get manufactured or processed and come out as 
finished product. So what goes in is called raw material. So based on what goes in, there are many, many types of industries. Agro-based industries, which is agricultural based, and all the agricultural products like wheat, rice, sugarcane, spices, tea, cotton, all those things go in. When you have animal-based, you have poultry farms, you have dairy farms where milk is transformed into cheese or butter or ghee or ice creams or any other dairy products. You also have skin of animals which are taken to make leather or goods and other skin related materials. Then you have mineral based industries which mainly include extraction of metals, extraction of precious elements, extraction of coal, petrol, all these are minerals and mineral based industries play a huge role in improving the economy and also in all and also su supporting and manufacturing of large variety of goods the last one would be forest based industries which is mainly used for furniture for paper for energy as firewood and all the other related aspects so these are industries based on what goes in or based on finished products what comes out we have primary industries we have secondary industries we have tertiary industries and we have ancillary industries so primary are the basic industries or the most important industries because it is iron and steel industry why is iron and steel considered as the most important one because every other industry depends upon an iron and steel industry if there is no iron and steel industry in a country there would be no other industry because every other industry has to have machines and all those machines should be made out of iron and steel so imagine if there is no iron and steel industry there would be no other industry so that's how important an iron and steel industry is. second industries are the industries which produce goods which are mostly demanded and bought by people automobiles car bus vehicles like cycle or two wheelers are all there in everybody's homes furnitures in everybody's homes food materials in everybody's homes so what are the most common things that everybody purchases and buys as a consumer those are second industries tertiary industries is not actually an industry but it, these are utility services which are provided by the government on a large scale a government provides the service of transport through road and rail not just for a small state but for the whole country so on a large scale they are pro providing services utility services uh, so transportation is an example of that and transportation through roadways railways highways so you have this picture of railways and roadways so all these money which is put in to make these roads and rails and there's an industry would be working behind it to produce these rail lines or produce these coaches uh, train coaches and all so the industry which is supporting and is helping in uh, the country's utility services would be tertiary industries ancillary is also a very important industry which helps in the production of spare parts which is needed for primary which is needed for secondary and it's also needed for tertiary so spare part production would be falling under ancillary industry based on the size of the product either it is light or heavy products heavy products include machines large structures gear systems and so forth and so on while light industries include cloth textiles papers cardboards any light products which are produced so based on the size of the products or based on the weight of the product we can describe or differentiate it into two types heavy and based on ownership is a very important classification criteria who does it belong to or who owns it government owns it it's called government sector example of indian oil or any other oil sector company or metal iron and steel companies are all government sector ownership then you have private sector of it companies like infosys wipro tcs tata consultancy services and other private companies whether it is owned by an individual or a group of private people then you have joint sector such as oil india limited or tata iron and steel company all these are both come shared by government and by a group of private people then you have cooperative sector which is the most creative and the most efficient one where a group of people put in what they have and take the benefits in a shared manner the example is a mold dairy farm which is in gujarat which started in gujarat where a group of people in the village started to come and contribute the milk they had from their daily milking of the cow and imagine one person was able to give one liter and 100 people gave together one liter and so 100 into 1 you will get 100 liters and the sector cooperative sector was able to make many dairy products from 100 liters of milk and they were able to make a benefit and the profit they make they will be able to share it with all the people who contributed the milk so that is called cooperative sector and that is the most efficient and beneficial way of ownership when it comes to 
industries the last one is okay the last but one there's one more to go location and market where is it present is it present in cottage or is it present in village or is it present as like how we've learned before which is urban industries so urban industries include the government sector oil companies or the private sector it companies or the joint sector dairy farms so those are urban industries when we have village industry as a group of people from or throughout a village comes and helps in the production of food products or helps in the production of cloth weaving and textiles like khadi all these things are a part of village industry while well, cottage industry happens in a particular home where just two three people come and do a particular craft it can be handicraft it can be food products it can be pottery just two three people and they are producing or manufacturing it in a home or a small environment so that is cottage industries now okay, moving into the first type of the three agro based industries cotton industry is the first one and you have the journey of cotton from the field where its cotton balls is separated and the fiber is taken and then it is spun into a thread called yarn and then it threads are woven together to make the cotton fabric all of us have cotton fabric at home and most of us not most of us everybody would have a cotton t-shirt and every day we would be wearing a cotton t-shirt but most of us don't know the journey the cotton t-shirt has to go through before it comes to our hand so the next time you take out a cotton t-shirt i want you to remember the video which you're going to watch right now while cotton is one of the most polluting crops to the environment so what are the efforts we can take to make sure that we are not polluting the environment we are making it uh, we are using it for a good purpose and we are not harming the environment in any way are there any other ways in which we can utilize it in a better way so i hope you watch the video and get a broad understanding of how is the journey of a cotton t-shirt from the balls to the time you wear it at home consider the classic white t-shirt annually we sell and buy 2 billion t-shirts globally making it one of the most common garments in the world but how and where is the average t-shirt made and what's its environmental impact clothing items can vary a lot but a typical t-shirt begins its life on a farm in america china or india where cotton seeds are sown irrigated and grown for the fluffy bowls they produce self-driving machines carefully harvest these puffs an industrial cotton gin mechanically separates the fluffy bowls from the seeds and the cotton lint is pressed into 225 kg bales the cotton plants require a huge quantity of water and pesticides 2700 liters of water are needed to produce the average t-shirt enough to fill more than 30 bathtubs meanwhile cotton uses more insecticides and pesticides than any other crop in the world these pollutants can be carcinogenic harm the health of field workers and damage surrounding ecosystems some t-shirts are made of organic cotton grown without pesticides and insecticides but organic cotton makes up less than 1% of the 22.7 million metric tons of cotton produced worldwide. Once the cotton bales leave the farm, textile mills ship them to a spinning facility, usually in China or India, where high-tech machines blend, card, comb, pull, stretch, and finally twist the cotton into snowy ropes of yarn called slivers. Then yarns are sent to the mill where huge circular knitting machines weave them into sheets of rough grayish fabric treated with heat and chemicals until they turn soft and white. Here the fabric is dipped into commercial bleaches and azo dyes which make up the vivid coloring in about 70% of textiles. Unfortunately, some of these contain cancer-causing cadmium, lead, chromium, and mercury. Other harmful compounds and chemicals can cause widespread contamination when released as toxic wastewater in rivers and oceans. Technologies are now so advanced in some countries that the entire process of growing and producing fabric barely touches a human hand. But only up until this point. After the finished cloth travels to factories, often in Bangladesh, China, India, or Turkey, Human labor is still required to stitch them up into t-shirts. Intricate work that machines just can't do. 
This process has its own problems. Bangladesh, for example, which has surpassed China as the world's biggest exporter of cotton t-shirts, employs 4.5 million people in the t-shirt industry. But they typically face poor conditions and low wages. After manufacture, all those t-shirts travel by ship, train, and truck to be sold in high-income countries, a process that gives cotton an enormous carbon footprint. Some countries produce their own clothing domestically, which cuts out this polluting stage. But generally, apparel production accounts for 10% of global carbon emissions. And it's escalating. Cheaper garments and the public's willingness to buy boosted global production from 1994 to 2014 by 400% to around 80 billion garments each year. Finally, in a consumer's home, the t-shirt goes through one of the most resource-intensive phases of its lifetime. In America, for instance, the average household does nearly 400 loads of laundry per year, each using about 40 gallons of water. Washing machines and dryers both use energy, with dryers requiring five to six times more than washers. This dramatic shift in clothing consumption over the last 20 years, driven by large corporations and the trend of fast fashion, has cost the environment, the health of farmers, and driven questionable human labor practices. It's also turned fashion into the second largest polluter in the world after oil. But there are things we can do. Consider shopping secondhand. Try to look for textiles made from recycled or organic fabrics. Wash clothes less and line dry to save resources. Instead of throwing them away at the end of their life, donate, recycle, or reuse them as cleaning rags. And finally, you might ask yourself, how many t-shirts and articles of clothing will you consume over your lifetime? And what will be their combined impact on the world? I think that video gave us a great understanding of the journey of a cotton t-shirt and it also showed the dark side of how more production and more desire of consumption and the desire to consume and buy a lot of clothing has impacted the earth in a very very bad way and it also gave us a lot of solution tips by reusing clothes and buying second hand or lending clothes to others or transforming our clothes which can't be worn anymore into cleaning material these are many ways in which we can make sure that we are reusing and making the environment a better place so i hope you guys do that and i hope you guys understand that cotton is one of the most commonly used fabric in our country and it has a very big diverse effect on the environment so every time you buy a t-shirt or every time you pick up a t-shirt understand that it has already created an impact and make sure that it doesn't create more impact okay moving into cotton in detail india is one of the largest cotton textile manufacturers and exporters in the world cotton textile supports 40 percentage of india's neighbor labor force so if there are 100 people who are laborers 40 people of them would be directly related to a cotton industry that's the amount of proportion that Indian laborers are connected to the cotton textile industry. Divided into two types, handloom and powerloom. Handloom means it's woven manually and it is famous in important cities like Ahmedabad, Mumbai, Coimbatore. Powerloom is woven by machines where huge machines are constructed and they weave and comb and twist and dry the cotton. As Maharashtra, Gujarat and Tamil Nadu have huge powerlooms. You can see a picture of handloom and powerloom where you can clearly understand that handloom is done by human hands where weaving of intricate fibers is done manually using wooden machines and powerloom is done by motorized machines where no human effort is needed it is directly weaved by machines distribution is an important factor in all the three maharashtra and gujarat are the leading producers of cotton 50 percent of india's cotton is produced there Mumbai is also called Cottonopolis or Lancashire of India, while Ahmedabad is also known as Manchester of India. These terms would be usually asked in your exams. Why is Ahmedabad called Manchester of India? Why is Mumbai called Cottonopolis? Why is Mumbai called Lancashire of India? You should know the reasons behind it. These are the following reasons. It is very near to raw materials. The raw materials which Mumbai and Ahmedabad need are produced nearby. They have perfect climatic conditions. They have excellent transport system. They have enough labor force in a place like Maharashtra and uh, Gujarat, which has Ahmedabad, there are so much population and people who are 
majority of them are laborers and these cities have enough labor to support these industries power both these cities are supported by hydroelectric power projects in both maharashtra and gujarat so they don't have to expect or depend on other places for energy to run their industries they have a huge market for cloth here people in maharashtra and gujarat are extremely urbanized and it's highly developed and there are many people who come from other countries who also live there so if there's no market there is no use of producing a lot of goods but when there's a good market when there's many people who are willing to buy then it is really good so huge market for cotton cloth is always here presence of ports are present in both cities both are coastal areas where export can be easily done and import also can be done so transportation and mainly export is also easily done in ahmedabad or in gujarat and maharashtra but still there are a lot of problems in the cotton industry and here are the problems which are written down inadequate production shortage of power not in all places we have good energy and good source of power source and shortage of raw materials is also there not in every place we have uh, good raw materials of cotton balls from the field directly loss of foreign markets because nowadays new quality and newer other varieties of fabric is produced nobody needs cotton anymore cotton is no more a part of the fashion wear cheaper other materials made out of synthetic fabrics has become more common fashion and these are produced in japan taiwan and china old machinery india has many of the places where india has power looms are having old machines 60 percentage of the spindles are more than 30 years old and only 80 percent of the power looms are there in india compared to 62 percent in other countries so india needs to produce more cotton fabrics but how can we do it by increasing the power looms because handloom products take a lot of time for producing but power loom products can be produced very fast but in our country power loom machines are very very less in percentage okay handloom is the second half where it is also called khadi it is one of the oldest industries in india till date it provides employment to a rare group of people who are skilled in this craft widely distributed across the country concentrated in small towns and rural areas tamil nadu odisha uttar pradesh andhra pradesh and assam contribute 50 percentage of the production so you can know that people who do khadi or handloom are very rare not everybody knows this craft so it like pottery or like making something out of wooden materials or carving khadi is also a very very rare technique and craft but many people don't know this craft but since it is in less demand nobody wants to buy khadi products the people who do this craft those kind of people's occupation and their livelihood is at risk so the problems they face is craftsmen come from poor families they need high pay to manage their families when they don't get high pay they obviously quit this job and go for another job old techniques they use take so much of time for one cloth to be produced which is not helpful in the market and nobody is wanting to wait so much time for a cloth to be produced third problem is that they always have a competition with power loom or milk cloth and milk cloth at one day they'll produce thousand clothes while a khadi industry in one day they can produce only 100 clothes or even 10 clothes so there's a huge difference in competition and obviously they are going to lose low capital the amount of people who are working are from poor families so the amount they can put in also also very less so they have to sell the product for a higher rate so many people won't buy it less facilities you can see that khadi industries would be done in places which is small and the environment is also difficult people are from difficult backgrounds they don't have good energy uh, resources they don't have a good environment to work in all these are lack of good facilities which also is a problem for the khadi industry so when next time when you go to a place where you want to buy the difference between notice the difference between a handloom and a power loom product this is just a common lungi so the handloom has holes holes at the bottom because of the punching machine while the power loom because it's printed and because it's uh, weaved using a machine it won't have any holes at the bottom so you can clearly understand the difference when the strands of the fiber is coming out at the bottom it means that it is handloom when it is neatly printed and cut out it is power loom silk industry is the second one the production of silk from silkworm is called sericulture you can see that the silkworm is producing cocoon uh, which is a secretion from its mouth india is one of the largest producers of silk silk when we compare to cotton is totally different it is extremely expensive because it is extremely rare 
Cotton is extremely common and it is much more cheaper. Four varieties of silk are there in India: mulberry, eri, thasar, and muga. And you can see how the secretion is turned into the cocoon, and the cocoon is turned into the fiber, and the fiber finally is turned into the fabric of silk, which is very beautiful to see. The first modern silk factory in India was started. by east india company at haura which is in west bengal in 1832 here is a video of the production of silk you can take a look and have the understanding of how a silk worm produces its secretion and how it is transformed into one of the most costliest fabric in the whole world silk fabric originated in china at least 5000 years ago and became a coveted luxury silk thread is produced by silkworms when they make their cocoons Sericulture or commercially breeding silkworms for silk production is practiced in several Asian countries. From home goods to accessories and clothing, there are few textiles as elegant and luxurious or as prized throughout the ages as silk. It's hard to believe this beautiful fabric comes from worms. The female silkworm lays up to 400 eggs in one shot, then promptly dies. Each egg, about 2 weeks later, hatches into a larva. The larva feeds on fresh mulberry leaves continuously, increasing its body weight 10,000-fold and growing to a length of about 3 inches. Then, as it enters the pupa phase of its life cycle, it excretes liquid raw silk from salivary glands in its mouth. When that liquid silk contacts with the air, it hardens into a single thread. Pupating larva winds that thread around itself into a thick, cozy cocoon. Normally, the pupa inside becomes a moth and the cocoon breaks as it emerges. However, this severs the continuous silk thread. So to keep the thread intact, they boil the cocoon for about 3 minutes to kill the pupa inside before it transforms into a moth. Boiling the cocoons also makes the wound thread easier to unravel by melting away most of the sericin, the gelatinous protein that binds it. To harvest the silk, they take threads from 30 to 50 cocoons at a time. They feed them all together through a hole in the bamboo stick. onto a hand operated reel then slowly and carefully they turn the reel unraveling the cocoons as the thread passes together through the stick the remaining sericin glues them together forming a single thicker thread the silk threads coming together are so fine only about 1/100 of a millimeter in diameter that it takes 2 to 3000 cocoons to produce a pound of silk thread. Unraveling cocoons is a time-consuming process because a single thread can be as long as 9 professional soccer fields. To make this feather-like silk thread easier to handle, they weigh it down with sand before rolling it into a bundle. Next, they wash away the sand and remaining sericin, then bleach the thread so it will uniformly absorb the synthetic dye. It's critical to monitor the ratio of dye to hot water, as well as water temperature and soaking time, as all these factors combined affect the quality of the color. After rinsing away the excess dye with lukewarm water, they hang the thread to dry. They mount the bundles of dry dyed silk thread on a big machine which transfers them to smaller rollers. Those rollers then go on an automated machine which transfers the thread to small bobbins. To craft silk fabric, weavers will pass bobbins of thread horizontally between vertical threads on a traditional hand operated loom. Another machine meanwhile winds thread around spools. A worker then installs a set number of spool threads on a mechanism which aligns them vertically on the loom parallel to each other. Fabric that's about 3 feet wide typically requires 4000 vertical threads. By stepping on the loom's foot pedal, 
the weaver repeatedly raises every second vertical thread and with a tug of a cord passes a shuttle containing a bobbin of thread horizontally in between. This intertwining of horizontal and vertical threads weaves the silk fabric. To create a pattern, the weaver uses multiple shuttles containing threads of different colors, thicknesses, and textures. Some patterns, such as an intricate weave called brocade, are so intricate that even the most experienced weavers produce just two to six inches of fabric per day. Now that's wearable art. That video told us how and why is silk expensive. One mainly because the amount of silk thread we get from maybe hundreds or thousands of cocoon is still very less. Another reason is that if the silk breaks, if the thread breaks, the loss would be severe because as long as the thread is, the better the fabric would be, the better the weaving would be. And the third is the intricate weaving of handloom industry. There's also handloom in silk where you saw people weaving with their own hands using a wooden machine. So all those kind of things where it ended, the video ended by saying even the most difficult patterns, even the most uh, uh, experienced, experienced people who do this silk weaving can do only three to five inches in a, in a day, which is very, very small. So all these factors are important to us so that we are able to understand why silk is so expensive. So if you have a silk cloth at home, just make sure that a lot of lot of silk worms died because of that. Many people worked so hard behind that. And that is the reason why you were able to have it. Moving into the mulberry silk, it is considered as one of the best variety of silk. And the silk worms feed on mulberry tree leaves and it's considered as the highest quality of silk accounts of 90% of the natural silk produced in India, produced from silk worms which are reared only on mulberry trees or they consume mulberry leaves. 100% pure silk is fully white. When we started the silk industry slide, you saw a picture at the bottom right where you saw white silk, which is an example of mulberry silk. Significant producers of mulberry silk are Bangalore, Mysore, Srinagar and Himachal Pradesh. So in these places, mulberry silk or this white pure silk is very commonly produced. Distribution, Karnataka, 70% of country's mulberry silk, best climate for rearing silk worms, and some places in Karnataka have huge power looms. West Bengal also produces good mulberry variety, and there are some sericulture farms there. While Assam is totally different from Karnataka and West Bengal because these produce non-mulberry silk like Tassar, Eri, Muga, and Muga is a very famous tribe which is producing, which is which go which is golden in color, and when you wash it, it increases its shining property or lusher. Harvested only twice a year near the Makka Valley in Assam and some districts. So I'll show you a picture of this golden Muga silk, which is very beautiful to see. You can see the larva or the silkworm which is secreting this golden color thin thread and when it is transformed into the silk fiber it looks something like this golden yellow muga silk which is produced in Assam and it is considered very very expensive mainly because it is harvested only twice in a year but just like cotton silk also has a lot of problems and these are the problems artificial silk competition many com companies and countries are producing fake or artificial silk which looks like silk but it is cheaper and it is better in quality in a way in which it stays for a long period of time but it might affect the environment and the people who are wearing it change in process of raw silk affects weavers in industries change in prices so if the government has set a particular set of price then the weavers are not able to gain more money and they're not able to work in their industry for a long period of time lack of sericulture depending on other countries for silk is also proving costly india needs to have uh, more trees which is able to rear silk worms and that can help us to produce our own sericulture and not expect silk worms and cocoons from other countries so we are spending a lot of money in that itself so we will obviously be selling silk fabrics in a much more higher rate if you are able to produce our own silk worms and our own silk cocoons then sericulture is cheap then we don't have to import silk cocoons and it's much more a cheaper price when we sell it machinery no systematic testing 
to upgrade the quality of natural silk increasing need of modern power looms just like in cotton we have still have less power looms in our country and the quality of silk which we used to produce 10 years ago is the same quality we produce now there's no increasing in quality because we haven't tested to upgrade the quality of natural silk so these are all the problems that silk industry is facing this is a map which clearly describes uh, different fabrics and most of them are silk fabrics you can see in the southern part of india in the western part of india in the eastern in the central and the northern part of india every state is known for a particular fabric this also tells about how diverse a country is not just in food or culture or tradition or any other belief systems but we are also totally diverse even in fabric and even in silk fabric there are so many varieties of silk and we can be proud that our country is extremely diverse even in fabrics you can just take a look at the many different kinds of fabrics and you should know at least two or three fabric silk fabrics which india is famous for and the state it comes from moving into the last industry in agro which is the sugar industry and we consume sugar every single day sugar is a very common part of our everyday diet but you need to know how sugar is produced and here's a video which tells that these machines harvest the cane by cutting it at the base the heavier lengths of cane drop into the base of a conveyor which feeds them into the transport bin that follows alongside at the mill trucks empty their load onto a receiving table it feeds a belt conveyor that takes the cane through two separate washes the cane must be as clean as possible for extracting the juice But first, the cane's hard structure is broken down inside this crusher, where rotating hammers break the cane into small pieces. A conveyor loads it into a milling tandem designed to extract the sweet juice from the crushed cane. In this milling tandem, the cane passes through a series of five or more consecutive mills. Large cylinders compress the cane fiber. The juice pours out of the milling tandem and diverts into a channel away from the bagasse, the dry pulp that remains after extracting the juice. A worker supervises the operation at each of the mills. A vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice is extracted from the sugar cane, it's time to process it. However, before it's turned into sugar crystals, a sample goes through a series of tests at the sugar mill's laboratory. They add a thickener that binds to impurities in the juice and then filter it to make it clear and clean. Then it's poured into a polarimeter, a machine that measures the concentration of sugar. The juice from the mills now falls through this 10 meter high tower as sulfur dioxide vapors rise through it. This process, known as sulfitation, bleaches the juice. Then it flows through a device that measures its pH level. While at a separate vat, workers add powdered lime to water, preparing a solution to which they will then add the juice. An agitator mixes the cane juice and lime solution for about 6 hours to complete a process called alkalization. It regulates the juice's pH level and helps clarify it. In reaction to the lime, the juice's color changes from brown to yellow. Next, the juice goes into these clarifier tanks. It takes over 2 hours for the juice to settle and for the impurities to fall to the bottom of the tank. A sample taken from the tank shows how the sludge collects at the bottom while the clarified juice collects at the top. There's still quite a way to go before it's transformed into the stuff that goes into your tea. Workers filter the residue, known as mud, from the clarifier tanks to extract any remaining sugar.
There's no waste here. The mud will fertilize the cane fields and the bagasse left over will be burned as fuel. The clarified juice collected from the clarifier tanks now boils in a series of evaporators. This brings the concentration of the sugar in the juice up from 15% to 60. Then the juice collects in 15 ton tanks to clarify even more. Any sediment left in the juice floats to the top. A rotating paddle skims this residue off to the sides of the tank. These tanks produce a type of syrup that goes on for still more processing. Workers now pour sucrose crystals suspended in alcohol into the syrup. This milky solution binds to the sugar present in the syrup and helps draw it out. Next, it all boils in large vacuum pans, forming sugar crystals. As the water in the syrup boils away, workers regularly check to see how the sugar is crystallizing. The goal? To produce a thick crystallized paste known as masquite. It then goes into a high-speed centrifugal machine to remove the sugar crystals from the uncrystallized syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1,200 revolutions per minute. This action draws the molasses to the outer shell of the machine, while the crystals remain in the inner basket. Sprays of water wash the crystals, then the water is drawn out so only the crystals remain. This centrifuge draws out moisture from the sugar, just like a washing machine on spin cycle dries your clothes. Next, a conveyor belt carries the sugar crystals out of the centrifuge. This mill produces raw sugar, which has more molasses and is unbleached, and plantation white sugar, which has less molasses and is bleached a brilliant white. Okay, in that video we understood the step-by-step -step explanation of how sugar can from the field is transformed into white crystalline sugar. It just is crushed and the juice is taken out then it is sent through a sulfur dioxide tank to increase its alkaline level and increase its acidity and then lime powder is added which neutralizes it and reduces its acidity because lime or calcium is alkaline and then it is added to a thickener and it becomes a thick paste and in each step you know you are able to understand the byproducts or the waste which comes out the fiber which came out at the beginning was called bagasse. The mud or the soil like thing which came out is called dress mud or just mud. Uh, and the last one, the thick brown fluid is called molasses. So at the end of the video, we found out that there are two kinds of sugar which are produced, which is much more. One is which has more molasses and more sugar content, which is little more brownish white and the other one which is sparkling white. So the more whiter your sugar is, it means that the more dangerous you uh, sugar you are consuming because it is bleached more and it is sucrose content is injected more and it is made white using chemicals. But if it's slightly more brownish in color, it means that it's much more safer and it's a much more better option. So we'll be discussing about you understood the step by step explanation and transformation of how sugar can is transformed to sugar crystals. Now we'll be just looking through the byproducts, the three byproducts which you've already seen in the video. So sugarcane is an important cash crop, second largest globally next to Brazil. In India, sugarcane is the second largest next to cotton. Help in producing sugar or jaggery. You can see the pictures of sugar and jaggery. So in India, it is an important cash crop. And India is the second largest producer of sugar next to Brazil. And in India, cotton is the biggest production and then we have second sugar we produce sugar and jaggery well jaggery is mostly used in 
village areas and sugar is mostly used in city so there are three byproducts of sugar number one molasses which is obtained out of repeated crystallization and centrifugation of sugar from sugar cane you saw this black fluid which is thick and black rich in iron calcium magnesium it is used mainly for the alcohol industry while well, rum and other kinds of alcohol is distilled using this thick black then you have bagasse which is the dry fibrous leftover remains of sugar cane which can mainly used to regenerate a steam uh, and produce energy for the industry to run if you compare all the other industries sugar industry is one of the most self sufficient industries where they themselves produce what they need for them to do for them for production to happen the next time because they take the press mud which is the next thing we'll go, we are going to learn and they use it as fertilizers they use the bagas and they use it uh, for producing energy for, so that when we burn it heat is produced so and they also use molasses for a sub by product like alcohol for distilling it so they are self sufficient industry which uses its waste for a benefit bagas has also have other benefits like it also helps in the production of fine tissue papers and also compress it the third one press mud looks like soil or wet soil it is a solid powdered waste from sugar cane rich in organic compounds like nitrogen phosphorus and potassium mainly used as a component for bio manure and bio fertilizers it helps in improving physical chemical and biological properties of the soil and crop yield so this when it is compressed and when the waste the liquid is taken out the remaining solid waste is called press mud it is mainly used as fertilizers and to improve the fertility when the next set of crops of sugar cane is put distribution maharashtra northern india and peninsular india leading producer more than one third of india's production climate is ideal here sucrose content is higher narrow belt of manmad in the north to kolhapur in the south has 190 mils in maharashtra itself they have a crushing period of 140 days this crushing period is a very very important term which you have to know in your exam they might ask what is called crushing period crushing period is the time period from when the sugarcane is cut or harvested to the time when it is crushed and the juice is taken out so if you have a larger crushing period it means that even if it is transported and it is kept in a mill for a long time and then it is crushed after 140 days still it will give good juice so still it can produce good sugar imagine that it has a crushing period of just 50 days what will happen when you take the sugar cane from one place to another and it and by the time it reaches the mill by the time it is kept in the store room and by the time it is crushed 50 days is crushed it is 60 or 65 days by the time it is crushed the sugar content will become very very less so if a sugar cane has high crushing period it means that it is going to produce good quality sugar if the sugar cane has low crushing period it will produce much more bad quality sugar up is the second largest producer it is a part in northern india it has two belts in northern india ganga yamuna doa belt which is in meerut and saharanpur in up and the terai belt which is in basti and gorakhpur up is the largest producer but became the second largest and maharashtra became the first because of old mills because of shorter crushing periods just like how we explained before and because of labor problems there are not many laborers who want to work in the up region in the sugar industry third part is the peninsular india which is the southern india Tamil Nadu has higher hectare yield, high sucrose content, and the longest crushing season of all. So hectare yield is when the amount of yield or productivity a particular land is giving. One hectare of land is giving more yield of sugar than any other place in India, and that is in Tamil Nadu. Coimbatore, Trichy, Vellore, Vellore are some districts in Tamil Nadu which is very good in sugar industry and sugar plantation, sugar cane plantation. Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh also contribute to. India's peninsula sugar production there are many reasons why the northern parts of india sugar mills are shutting down and the southern parts of india sugar mills are increasing so the tendency of this industry sugar industry to migrate towards the south these are the reasons favorable climate more black soil excellent transportation near mills which save sugar content so you don't have to transport the sugar cane from the field to the mills very far off it is nearby so the sugar content is saved bigger areas for fields plain areas not much mountain regions and new machinery is much more developed in the southern regions 
just like cotton and silk sugar industry also have problems and the problems are low yield per hectare in most parts low sucrose content so together it's poor quality fields are far away from factories and government have fixed rates so the government are not allowed allowing the farmers to increase the rate of sugar cane so this is the high cost of production more money to produce sugar and molasses and bagasses are not fully utilized if you consider other countries where sugar cane is produced sugar is produced the molasses and bagasses are fully 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 used nothing goes as waste but in our country they are not fully utilized they go as they go as waste demand for jaggery gourd and khansari is two types of jaggery which is produced and it is more commonly used in rural areas they don't need sugar rural areas mostly produce or use khansari and gourd which is a variety of jaggery and which is a healthier version so they prefer that so not much of sugar is used in most parts of india we learned with this short video most of us love sugar and most of us love the sweet taste and why do we most of us love the sweetness because we learned about sugar we can learn about something interesting why do many of us like the sweet taste of sugar even though all of us are not fond of sweet but i don't think there's anybody who hates sweet if there's something sweet that we are offered we don't hate it or we don't say i totally dislike sweet we just try it and there's a sensation in our body which craves creates a craving for us to like it or taste it even more what happens in our body when we consume something which is sweet this is something which is very interesting which will help you to realize that oh my god this thing happens in my body when i consume something sweet so check it out picture warm gooey cookies crunchy candies velvety cakes waffle cones piled high with ice cream is your mouth watering are you craving dessert why what happens in the brain that makes sugary foods so hard to resist sugar is a general term used to describe a class of molecules called carbohydrates and it's found in a wide variety of food and drink. Just check the labels on sweet products you buy. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, lactose, dextrose, and starch are all forms of sugar. So are high fructose corn syrup, fruit juice, raw sugar, and honey. And sugar isn't just in candies and desserts. It's also added to tomato sauce, yogurt, dried fruit, flavored waters, or granola bars. Since sugar is everywhere, it's important to understand how it affects the brain. What happens when sugar hits your tongue? And does eating a little bit of sugar make you crave more? You take a bite of cereal. The sugars it contains activate the sweet taste receptors, part of the taste buds on the tongue. These receptors send a signal up to the brain stem, and from there it forks off into many areas of the forebrain, one of which is the cerebral cortex. Different sections of the cerebral cortex process different tastes, bitter, salty, umami, and in our case, sweet. From here, the signal activates the brain's reward system. This reward system is a series of electrical and chemical pathways across several different regions of the brain. It's a complicated network, but it helps answer a single subconscious question. Should I do that again? That warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you taste grandma's chocolate cake? That's your reward system saying, mmm, yes. And it's not just activated by food. Socializing, sexual behavior, and drugs are just a few examples of things and experiences that also activate the reward system. But overactivating this reward system kickstarts a series of unfortunate events, loss of control, craving, and increased tolerance to sugar. Let's get back to our bite of cereal. It travels down into your stomach and eventually into your gut. And guess what? There are sugar receptors here too. They're not taste buds, but they do send signals telling your brain that you're full or that your body should produce more insulin to deal with the extra sugar you're eating. The major currency of our reward system is dopamine, an important chemical or neurotransmitter. There are many dopamine receptors in the forebrain, but they're not evenly distributed. Certain areas contain dense clusters of receptors, and these dopamine hotspots are a part of our reward system. Drugs like alcohol, nicotine, or heroin send dopamine into overdrive, leading some people to constantly seek that high. In other words, to be addicted. Sugar also causes dopamine to be released, though not as violently as drugs. And sugar is rare among dopamine-inducing foods. Broccoli, for example, has no effect, which probably explains why it's so hard to get kids to eat their veggies. Speaking of healthy foods, let's say you're hungry and decide to eat a balanced meal. You do, and dopamine levels spike in the reward system hotspots. 
But if you eat that same dish many days in a row, dopamine levels will spike less and less, eventually leveling out. That's because when it comes to food, the brain evolved to pay special attention to new or different tastes. Why? Two reasons. First, to detect food that's gone bad. And second, because the more variety we have in our diet, the more likely we are to get all the nutrients we need. To keep that variety up, we need to be able to recognize a new food, and more importantly, we need to want to keep eating new foods. And that's why the dopamine levels off when a food becomes boring. Now back to that meal. What happens if in place of the healthy, balanced dish, you eat sugar-rich food instead? If you rarely eat sugar or don't eat much at a time, the effect is similar to that of the balanced meal. But if you eat too much, the dopamine response does not level out. In other words, eating lots of sugar will continue to feel rewarding. In this way, sugar behaves a little bit like a drug. It's one reason people seem to be hooked on sugary foods. So think back to all those different kinds of sugar. Each one is unique, but every time any sugar is consumed, it kickstarts a domino effect in the brain that sparks a rewarding feeling. Too much too often, and things can go into overdrive. So yes, overconsumption of sugar can have addictive effects on the brain. But a wedge of cake once in a while won't hurt you.